Uh, my name is David Langworthy. I am uh, I'm an engineer at Microsoft. I spent most of my time in um, uh, what has been called uh, uh, server and tools and then cloud and enterprise and is now Azure. Um, Leslie and I joined Microsoft at about the same time. And, oh, I should say what my title talk is. My talk is uh, TLA Plus Quinceañera. Uh, if you don't know what that word means, I will explain it about halfway through the talk. Um, Leslie and I joined Microsoft at about the same time, around 2003, and um, what he wanted to do was uh, take his specification language, TLA+, and work with a real engineer, uh, who was me, um, and specify a production system. And so um, uh, we worked together uh, at that time. With, uh, with Jim Johnson, who is another engineer, Leslie, and uh, uh, Fritz Vogt, and specified a, um, a web services transaction protocol. Now, this is just a two-phase commit protocol. Um, so you have a prepare phase and a commit phase. So that piece of the specification was, um, uh, you know, was very straightforward. Um, this protocol, but when we get down to the details of real implementation, sort of things get fancier. This protocol had the, both, the notion of both a durable participant, which is what you sort of traditionally expect, a, a disk or something like that, uh, and a volatile participant. A volatile participant is something like a cache or a, uh, a user interface, which is interested in the outcome uh, of the transaction, but doesn't save state. So when we were working on uh, this, this specification, um, nothing came up with two-phase commit, but the interaction between those, uh, the, ver the volatile and the, uh, the durable participants uh, posed some, you know, some issues. And another thing which is sort of uh, you know, set when you read the transaction processing books, you look at it and the, the number of participants are fixed up front. But what really happens is when you're running a transaction, uh, you, discover the transa you discover the participants as the transaction proceeds, and you figure out what resources you need. And it turns out that you'll even discover new participants after the prepare phase has begun. And uh, one thing that we discovered when writing this protocol was that um, uh, uh, New volatile participants could be uh, discovered after the um, uh, the volatile phase, the volatile prepare phase completed, and uh, so that needed to get cleaned up. And we cleaned that up and put that in the uh, both the TLA's plus specification, and this specification has been published as a uh, as an Oasis standard uh, XML over uh, over HTTP specification that anyone can go off and implement. So. Um, that was my introduction to, uh, to Leslie and to TLA Plus. And so um, that's how I got started in all of this. Um, another thing I should say is this is the work that I've done on the TLA Plus. Most of what I'm talking about and the, and the purpose of this exercise is not for me to write TLA specs. It's to figure out how to get lots of other people to go and write TLA Plus specs. Um, so this work was done in 2003 and things kind of, you know, bubbled along. I talked to Leslie whenever he came to, um, you know, to visit in Red Redmond. Um, uh, but, you know, not a whole lot happened with it. In, um, in, you know, 2014, uh, Leslie won the Turing Award. And so there was sort of, that was a big shot in the arm. Uh, I got people interested in Leslie. And, uh, and what he had to say. Um, and then shortly after that, in uh, 2015, um, Chris Newcomb and others published a paper uh, in CACM, Communications of the ACM, on how Amazon was using uh, TLA Plus to uh, uh, author you know, create services that were robust and high scale from the get go. And they'd done, you know, 10 specifications and they had all these services running and, um, and that's all great. You know, it was a huge, uh, uh, huge note of support for TLA plus. And it's great that, 
um, you know, it's out there and supporting some massive um, uh, clouds, you know, cloud service. You'll note, however, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned I'm from Microsoft, all right, and this is Amazon. And although we're very close and we're all friends and uh, everything like that, that's our, you know, number one competitor in the cloud space. So um, there's sort of a, you know, a deep irony there. And uh, so what happened then was Leslie, you know, noted that and uh, took some, you know, good quotes from their paper and other people that, uh, you know, had supported TLA through the, uh, TLA plus through the years, put that all in a nice concise mail and um, uh, through various channels sent that to uh, Satya Nadella, who is the, um, uh, who is the CEO of Microsoft. Microsoft is a software and cloud services company with about uh, 200,000 employees and uh, some huge amount of revenue, I don't even know. Uh, huge, huge company, right? Satya uh, gets a lot of things. He's a very big guy. Um, but he, you know, read this on his Christmas uh, vacation, I guess. And then uh, December 26th, Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, um, there, you know, I received in my mail while I was on vacation with my family, a mail directly to me and uh, every technical VP that I guess Satya could think of at the time, um, you know, talking about things. Satya doesn't send direct mails to me uh, very often, right? So this is highly unusual. Um, and the, you know, the, the gist of the mail uh, was super positive. It's like, you know, TLA plus is great. Why aren't we doing this? We should be doing this. We need reliability, blah, 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 blah. Go, 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 go. It's like, okay, great. Um, it's a lot of support. The, uh, the thing that, you know, was not clear at that time was what to do. Right, Leslie had been working, you know, for uh, for quite a while to get engineers across Microsoft to use TLA Plus, right? Um, and there was a you know a bunch of different ideas about how to go off and do that. Um, we could take and have people from MSR go out into the product teams and write specs for them. Um, uh, but what we decided to do instead was just go and uh, train engineers, just go get a whole bunch of engineers, teach them TLA plus and tell them to go write specs, right? And so, uh, so that sounds great. There was a question at the time whether or not, um, you know, just vanilla engineers that we, you know, pulled in off the street essentially, uh, could write a TLA plus spec, and um, there was an even larger question about whether or not they could learn how to do it in uh, the course of uh, the, you know, the time that we were allotting, which um, was two days, right? So two days to go off and take somebody just off the street, uh, you know, with a CS degree, a pro, you know, a pro engineer. Um, uh, teach them how to do, teach them how to implement TLA plus, and uh, then have a one-day kind of hackathon, specathon thing, and get them to go write specs. Right. So um, uh, that's the exercise. There was a you know a question about whether or not they could do that. Um, I believed they could. Uh, they'd do something. You know, you didn't know what. We'd find out. Right. It'd be a learning experience for for somebody, maybe just us. Um, and uh, so, so we ran that. It was, there was a super high level of interest, you know, in this. Um, you know, we had, Leslie just won the Turing Award and, you know, we had Satya saying, go, 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 and things like that, which, uh, which all helped. The room that we, uh, that we had held about um, uh, 80 people, actually it held 100 people, but we kind of squished it back, 80 people with, uh, with tables, um, we had a huge wait. We filled all that up almost instantly, and had a huge wait list for uh, you know for people to get in. Um, we had uh, about eighty people start the class. About fifty people made it through day three. Some people, you know, just came in, ate the free lunch on the first day, and 
said bye, uh, but that wasn't too many. Uh, had about 50 people uh, finish the class. They tended to work in groups to, uh, to write the spec, and I think the, you know, their specs, I think that that's a good practice, you know. Um, at, the, uh, at the end of the class, for the whole second, uh, the, the whole afternoon of the third day, um, we had people come up and talk about their specs and their experience learning DLA Plus and, and things like that. And we had 13 people, uh, well, 13 specs, so 13 groups come up and present, which is quite a few more than I thought we were going to get out of that. And, um, and that, you know, with those 13 specs all by themselves, put us at more specs than, um, than Amazon had. So, uh, so that's good. These were just starting specs, um, but still, uh, some of those have gone on, and I'm going to talk more about ones that have gone on uh, later in the day, later in my talk. So uh, people liked the class, they came, they, you know, learned TLA Plus in a very short amount of time, and uh, we have now run that, run that, uh, run that course three times um, uh, with about the same number of people and similar, uh, similar outcomes. Actually, the outcomes are kind of getting a little bit better because uh, people sort of know what they're getting into or have worked with somebody that has uh, worked with TLA Plus before or something like that. Um, and so this year uh, in April, it was time, you know, the season for another TLA Plus school. Um, but uh, like this is Leslie get, standing up and talking and saying essentially the same thing for two full days. Uh, and he was a little bit, you know, getting tired of that. So he has now made a, uh, a series of videos that you can watch that, you know, explain how to get started with, uh, with TLA Plus, which are essentially the uh, you know, the lecture, it's the lecture component uh, of this course is just available uh, out on the web. So this year, what we decided to do was have to do something different, which is um, have, which is to invite uh, everyone that has been trained across the company, which is about 200 engineers, to, uh, you know, to come back and tell us what they were doing and how they were using TLA Plus uh, in their uh, in their engineering systems, right? How they were using it on a day to day basis to, you know, uh, uh, help Azure, make Azure better, make the world a better place. So this year, we held the uh, the TLA Plus workshop. The um, TLA Plus workshop is. Um, uh, was we call it a workshop because people just came back and worked together. There wasn't like a sort of one to many uh, component where we were training. Um, but what we wanted uh, and asked for was people that had uh, written specifications and used them for various components of Microsoft products to come back in and tell us uh, what they were doing with it. And so uh, the response that we got on that was uh, was quite good. We had three executives, three vice presidents, and uh, six engineers come in and give talks. All of those represent, you know, works of work of groups, um, and often uh, multiple. Once they kind of get started with it, it's has a viral quality, and they'll you know do multiple uh, specifications. So. Um, uh, and it's like executives at Microsoft are, are super busy. I mean, if you're an engineer like me, you can go off to Oxford for a couple of days and give a talk or whatever. It's fine. It's great. Those guys are just completely slammed. They get worked uh, very, very hard. So having them come and talk to us and take a you know, chunk of their day was uh, a real commitment, uh, which we really appreciate. There's a big vote of support. So um, uh, they presented real specs. Uh, real systems, and they found real somethings. Uh, I've called them bugs. I started calling them bugs. The product teams have an issue because a bug is when your program is broken, right? And the thing is, their programs weren't broken, right? Because they'd written a spec. So um, uh, I guess that's the only place I haven't fixed it. Through the rest of the talk, I should uh, 
refer to these as invariant violations found by TLC, not bugs. Okay. Um, if you see it, then I need to fix it. Um, uh, but that is uh, something that several people felt, found, felt quite strongly about. All right. So now, this talk is the TLA plus quinceañera. How many people know what a quinceañera is? Does anybody? Good. Okay. Uh, quinceañera is a Latin American tra tradition. On a young woman's 15th birthday, um, uh, she has an introduction to society. Um, she gets a like kind of it's uh, kind of like a debutante thing, but it's just her. Uh, there's a big party. She gets a fancy dress. Um, if you've been paying attention to the dates, um, we started this project of getting broad-based engineers to uh, you know to use TLA plus 15 years ago, and so I am declaring this right here right now to be TLA plus's quinceañera. This is the big party. You were all the guests. Um, and the, the point is, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, and uh, if you look up pictures, you see like a fancy dress and things like that. I decided to leave that out. Um, but uh, the, the point of using that word and of this talk is that TLA plus is not a nascent thing which requires you know, parental guidance to use. You know, we don't have to send that out. It's something that is now uh, available to society at large, engineers at large can pick it up and use it uh, on their own, uh, you know, to their benefit. So this is sort of a, uh, you know, a coming out party. And uh, to support that, I am going to talk about the, uh, the various systems that, um, have used uh, TLA plus um, at Microsoft. And actually, I wanted to pause for a second. I was told that somebody was vision impaired and could use the, the deck, this deck on a USB stick. Do I need to do that? Is that, is, would that does anybody want, to, want the deck on a USB stick? No? OK, great. All right. Um, so. Uh, these are the different systems that um, have used TLA plus. Um, the first system that used TLA plus uh, is called Service Fabric. Um, that was written by uh, Gopal Kakavaya, who was a, uh, a developer and a development manager and now a vice president at, uh, at Microsoft. And, um, uh, uh, Tom Rodheffer, who was at MSR. Um, Leslie noted that you won't know who any of these people are, so why does it matter? Uh, I should just tell you sort of what they do. But I think it does matter uh, who they are. The point is that it's not me, right? And it's not Leslie. These are real people that are not, uh, you know, within the formal specifications community, uh, actual engineers uh, writing these specifications, and also they should get credit for their work. So I'm always going to name uh, who are the principals that have written the, uh, the specs. Uh, service Fabric is, um, uh, how many people know what Kubernetes is? OK, a couple. Uh, service Fabric is like Kubernetes. Uh, what it is is a, uh, an orchestration engine. Suppose you have like some little executable or a service and you want to run 10,000 or 100,000 copies of it and it has dependencies on six other services and you need to uh, get, all those, get all that deployed out onto you know, your machines and keep it up and running like all the time and issue a patch and have the patch roll out and if the patch has a bug in it and starts throwing errors, you want to abandon that patch and roll it back and uh, do all that. So that is what we call an orchestration engine or a service fabric. It's uh, what uh, Azure runs on, and it's what things like you know Amazon Web Services and others, uh, Google runs on. Google Kubernetes is the Google one. So um, uh, it's a you know a huge foundational component. It's not something that a you know, like um, uh, like Cloud Drive or something like that that you would use as an end user, but it's what um, 
uh, boots the cloud drive service. Okay, um, uh, this is a picture of the whole service fabric. Not all of this was specified. The piece that was specified is this foundational piece here, the Federation subsystem. And uh, it manages uh, replication and taking out leases on, um, on resources. Okay, so um, they, uh, Tom and Gopal, developed this algorithm sort of while they were writing it in TLA and checking it with TLC. And so they didn't really, when you're writing like that, they didn't really notice, note any specific invariance found with the specification because they sort of started from nothing and grew it out within the bounds. Um, one thing that several people have noted is a consistent theme is that writing in TLA and checking with TLA, TLC uh, forces you to ha define a clear boundary for your system. You know, what exactly is this component doing? And so um, they found that, uh, they found that very useful. Um, so this work was done in 2004. Uh, the system, you know, shipped. It's available as a consumer service. Uh, uh, most Azure services run uh, or, you know, are managed by the service fabric. Excuse me. Uh, sure. Uh, do you know any idea of how large the spec is in terms of lines of code or any, any kind of metric? Yes. Um, I don't have uh, this. I do not have this spec. Um, it was, it turned out to be uh, fairly large. This is you know, I'm remembering from reading the thing in 2004, right? So just put that little asterisk by the thing. This was a fairly large thing. How do I get back? Because, I mean, if you just think about uh, a Paxo spec, right, which is like a couple of pages of spec, you know, that's this piece, right? Um, uh, he also had uh, leasing. Uh, and routing and other things in there. So you sort of, like this thing has, um, you know, a Paxos, a, uh, a DHT, a distributed hash table in there. So it kind of, it got to be like a fairly chunky thing. Um, and one thing that I'm sort of, you know, uh, hesitant about is I'm presenting a lot of other people's work. And so a lot of perfectly reasonable questions to ask. I just don't have the answer for it because it's, again, not my work. Uh, but that's sort of the point, is that I didn't have to write all these specs. Also, uh, how did they decide that they wanted to specify that part of the system and not, say, reliability subsystem or other subsystems? You know? um, uh, I believe that this was built first and they so they wrote, they spec that. And um, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's the that. Okay. All right. This next spec uh, is called, is Azure Batch. Um, it was written by uh, Nargana Pathy, who is, a, uh, is an architect. And it is a specification of the pool server. So, um, uh, for Azure Batch. What does Azure Batch do? If you have like one executable and you want to run like 10,000 or 100,000 copies of that, um, you know, examples are you might be doing, um, uh, a good example is uh, rendering a movie, you know, so you've got some animated film um, and uh, you want to take and render you know, every single frame. Each one of those is sort of a separate independent process. You can fire that up, give it its, you know, initial data and let the thing go and finish. So it's kind of a compute, massive compute service. They're all doing exactly the same thing. Um, so what is happening 
there is we want to take one executable, just a DLL and XE, some like little package of stuff, run a whole bunch of copies of it. Um, it's hard for uh, a bunch of different reasons. One reason it's hard, it turns out we don't just have like 10,000 or 100,000 empty machines just sitting there waiting for load. All right. When you're running something like this, you need to go and cobble together, uh, you know, wherever you can find available compute from, you know, all over a data center. You know, uh, one one rack or another rack or uh, one row or another row, things like that. So you need to take and find all the compute and keep that together for it. Um, you need to make sure that you don't allocate more compute resources than you have available. So there's sort of a you know, a system quota for us. There's also a very important user quota. Um, uh, another thing that you could do with an Azure Batch thing is like Bitcoin mining. So if you could go and get 100,000 machines and run them for a half a day or something like that, you can probably get a Bitcoin out of them, right? Um, so people will like to go and just, you know, buy a credit card at the, you know, at the Tesco or whatever, a, a debit card, swipe it, set up an Azure account, allocate as many machines as they can, and uh, then you know, not pay the bill at the end of the month. So the way that we manage that is say, you know, unless we've got an ongoing relation, you can only use like some you know, 10, uh, you know, 20 machines or something like that. And then uh, if you need more, we need to go and uh, make sure that you have an ability to pay. So there's both a systems user constraint and a uh, uh, sort of a customer level constraint. Um, uh, the machines can go up and down, the pools can go up and down, the process that the people are trying to run can go up and down. So there's a lot of different failure modes that are quite complex. Um, uh, so what uh, NAR got out of this, and I'm actually going to skip ahead to my, uh, my slide, um, some of the slides in here that are excerpts that I've taken directly from other people's talks and some are my own that sort of summarize the, uh, the information. Um, the uh, uh, NAR didn't notice, NAR sort of built this system within, uh, you know, starting from scratch. He didn't have a pre-existing algorithm and just wrote it in TLA from the get-go. Um, again, he quoted TLA uh, with providing a, uh, a you know, a precise model of the functionality, um, a precise understanding of the, uh, the safety and the liveness properties. And uh, one thing that he found particularly useful was the invariance that he used to check the correctness of uh, the spec, you know, to give to TLC. Um, he took those invariants and uh, built them into the production code. All right, so the same invariants that we're running to uh, specify, you know, to check the correctness within TLA uh, are running in, um, you know, in the production system today. Uh, he actually wrote this, the, the production code for this in a, in a language called P sharp, where P is for um, essentially Petri net. Uh, so you can take and write in a, you know, sort of, uh, Petri net or actors style language. And then uh, given that description, uh, P sharp will spit two things. One, it will spit code that can just run, right? Uh, production code. And then two, it'll spit a, uh, uh, a specification which can be checked, not a TLA plus specification, but um, it'll spit a specification that can be, uh, be checked with our model checker Z3. And so uh, it has those. It's a, um, a, a much lower level spec than the TLA plus spec. He found, you know, uh, doing both of those useful. TLA plus was a very good way to get started. And then for, uh, and then he used those invariants, just put them into P sharp and wrote the system in P sharp. And it spitted all of the, uh, spat all of the code that he, uh, that he needed. Okay. Um, the next tower, next I'm going to talk about is Azure Storage. This is mentioned. This was written by Ching Wang. 
Ching started as a, uh, as a researcher in MSR and has since moved into uh, the product team, Azure Storage, as a developer. Um, and so the, uh, the problem here is Paxos ring management. If you have something like you know, Azure Storage or S3 or iCloud, uh, something like that, it, uh, you know, it doesn't all run on one Paxos ring. You know, one Paxos ring can manage a few machines, uh, but we need thousands of them in order to, uh, you know, to run. So managing all those rings becomes, a, um, becomes an issue. Um, so the way the system works is there's a controller that says what's needed, and then uh, the various machines go off and, uh, you know, and do it. Um, and so let me... Um, these are my slides. Let's go to, to this one here. So, um, so in this system, we have a ring. Uh, the, the example it is using here is three replicas, uh, let's say N1, N2, and N3. And what the controller wants to do is do something with, uh, with N2 and replace it with M4. You know, it needs to be patched or it's just an old box and they need to throw it away or something like that. And so uh, the, you know, the task at hand is to uh, take N2 out of the ring and put N4 into the ring and have it keep on going. The problem uh, that they found with the particular protocol that they were using for um, for doing this is that you could have a quorum split uh, under some conditions, all right, and end up with uh, two groups of machines that thought they were that they had quorum. Uh, in the example that shows here, um, well, the the problem is if you uh, if machine N two receives the you know the instruction to exit the you know the ring and then fails. All right, um, and uh, reboots having lost that operation, then um, it could think that it's still fine, go form a quorum with N1, all right, and then uh, N4, which is the new machine, it, for, as far as it's concerned, it, you know, N2 is gone, it can form a quorum with N3, and you've got a quorum split, and that's just um, uh, a disaster. You can have, uh, you know, data loss. It's it's not at all good. Um, what they uh, learned, well, the fix from this is to, uh, was, I don't know, uh, I thought kind of funny, is not to trust whatever it is that the manager is telling, saying to you. The machines should just, just read their log, right? They need, if they just trust their log, um, then you can't have the quorum split. And so uh, that was the observation that they had for that. And it's a fairly straightforward st fix. All right. Uh, Azure networking um, does what you'd expect. So you've got all the various, uh, you know, both inbound and outbound traffic for, uh, you know, into Azure and out of Azure. Uh, there's also a lot of things with subnets and um, uh, managing the communication between all the machines within Azure. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a complicated problem. It, you know, it just has to be right or else nothing else works. People expect it to be right. Uh, they have used it and it's also, uh, like it doesn't like networking doesn't leave any state around, right? It's very very difficult to uh, to debug issues. So they do a lot with specification of uh, of various sorts before their um, uh, their systems launch. The people that uh, that implemented this are um, uh, Albert Greenberg, who is a vice president, uh, Luis Marin Briz, who is a uh, manager, and Andrew and Andrew Helwer, who is a uh, who is a developer. Um, they have uh, specified uh, many systems 
the one that I'm going to talk about is uh, checkpoint coordination. So um, in that, uh, we have a, you know, a ring of replicas. Uh, in their system, uh, both the, uh, the primary, the master, and all the replicas can um, serve as traffic. They can serve as reads. And so, um, let's see. So what we want to do is uh, take a checkpoint or a backup or do something with one of the replicas. And the doing it with one turns out to be very important. Um, so you've got you know five replicas. You take one out. All right, you're down to eighty percent of the throughput. Uh, just without even considering the uh, the general loss of availability. If you somehow or another take down two, then you're down to 60% uh, to of the throughput, which is a significant uh, decrease. That's more than the, you know, the amount of headroom that you typically allocate. So um, the, uh, well, so you want exactly, so you want to make sure the machines get checkpointed. Um, uh, you want to make sure that uh, not two of them happen at once, um, and that things can also uh, crash and recover. Uh, the first uh, sort of implementation they considered is just having fixed type time slices. You break up type time into 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and if you're, uh, you know, number 3, you can take and uh, implement, you know, run your checkpoint whenever time slice 3 comes along. That's problematic for a couple of reasons. One, uh, time slices can go uh, wasted. Uh, the primary can't uh, take, you know, can't be taken offline. Um, and then also the just the window, the size of the window has to be the size for the longest uh, checkpoint. Um, they consider doing a, uh, uh, you know, a pseudo time slice, a slightly more flexible version of that. That also um, uh, had issues, and then with communication to latencies, like they didn't all agree on how the windows were lined up, and so that caused some problems. What they ended up with was a uh, uh, a leases model, and um, uh, wrote that in TLA plus and checked that, and. Um, uh, that turned out to be correct. I, uh, a question they had is if a if a replica becomes a primary, um, can it Im immediately start issuing leases to, uh, to other machines, or does it need to wait some quiesce period for like the longest lease before it can uh, take advantage of that? And the uh, the answer to that, which has been verified with uh, with TLC, is that um, so long as that uh, uh, newly minted primary is up to date, all right, um, that it can issue leases. I checked one more uh, optimization to that. Um, uh, suppose a machine becomes the primary and notices that the only lease that exists, it is holding, so the primary is holding a lease, it can't back up because it's the primary, can it go ahead and directly issue a lease? And so you might think, yes, um, the team uh, thought yes, but it turns out that um, uh, the answer is no, because um, uh, there might have been a failure of another system, you know, in the way, um, you know, it, in the middle that issued another lease to somebody else, and um, so discarding the lease will, uh, you know, would cause discarding a lease and then uh, granting a lease to somebody else, waking back up again, thinking that you had the lease would cause a problem. So they learned something here. Um, okay, this one, Azure IoT. What is IoT? IoT is Internet of Things. And what, uh, what that does is a huge pub sub and eventing service. Suppose you had, you know, every 
I know we have one here. Uh, well, suppose this room had a thermostat, uh, but every thermostat, um, you know, in uh, you know, in the war, you know that Honeywell had had built, you know, throws off telemetry. Uh, every BMW uh, throws off tons and tons of telemetry. Um, uh, suppose you want to take all this telemetry, and you've got a whole bunch of uh, different processes that are interested in different pieces of that or aggregations over that, uh, getting that huge information flow where you've really got, you know, uh, millions of devices throwing off information and, you know, also millions of services that are interested in it uh, and getting uh, all of that to, uh, you know, routed around uh, correctly is, um, uh, you know, a big technical problem. So that's what Azure IoT is. The, uh, the engineer that built this is uh, Kapil Agrawal. Um, the particular system that, um, uh, that, he, uh, that he implemented has not been shipped yet, so I can't tell you what it is, but it's going to be great. <laughs> I can tell you why it's going to be great, because uh, before they shipped it, before it's been shipped now, uh, they wrote a TLA spec of it, okay, uh, and they found several different issues uh, with it, all right, which are uh, not bugs because they're never shipped, right? Um, one of these was, one of the ones that they found was just like, it would have been found, it like wouldn't have really booted, it would have been obvious, the thing would have just fallen over. Um, but three of them uh, were, uh, you know, long failure trace, uh, cases that would have been extremely difficult to uh, uh, to diagnose and debug in a uh, you know in a production system, so uh, that was very heartening. Um, Kapil, I'm not even sure he came to one of the TLA plus classes. He you know didn't have a background in for formal methods, um, but was just you know uh, asked by management to write one of these things and went off and did it, um, and he was very surprised at you know what he found and and what he learned. Okay. Um, Is this the first time you used uh, TLA Plus? Yeah. Yeah, for, yes, most of the people in here, these are all the first times that they've used it, right? So it's all, uh, uh, it's essentially, I can't think of an example where, uh, where that's not the case. I haven't gone through and checked. And then, um, and also, most of the people don't have a background. You know, a lot of the people don't have a background in formal methods at all, right? If you've used something, um, then sort of moving from one specification off to another, you kind of know what's going on. And it's just a matter of figuring out the syntax and how the tool works. But just walking up cold, a you know, uh, a pro dev, um, and a, a pro dev, like what does that mean? A pro dev is somebody who has a degree in computer science and you know, has had algorithms and data structures, right? So we've got a, you know, you've got one of those. There's a lot of non-pro dev, and we, we love non-pro dev, right? They make our websites and things like that. There's a huge community of those. So it's not, I'm not talking about that group, but pro dev, uh, people can sort of pick this up and, you know, have, have used it. How long did it take to train them? How did they learn? Or are you going to get to that? <laughs> no, through the course you said in the beginning? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, so uh, for the most of these people, they got you know two days of Leslie standing up and talking, and uh, then we had a room with like 80 people in it and like three proctors uh, going around, uh, mostly you know telling them how to install the TLA tool pl toolkit or. You know, um, uh, one thing that a lot of people get stuck on is that uh, uh, indentation is significant. Uh, and um, uh, if you're used to uh, Kerning and Richie style syntax, uh, that, uh, you know, breaks people's head. But a lot of, we have a lot of Python developers now. And Python developers just, oh, of course indentation is significant. So, uh, you know, and I'll talk, uh, you know, more like anecdotes like that uh, later in the, uh, uh, you know, at the end, and I'm kind of, I don't know, what, what time did I actually get started? Okay, I'm, I'm 44 minutes in, so I am planning on going uh, about that time, and uh, is that all right? Okay, great. Uh, I mean, I'll use, I'll use an hour. Um, 
I believe this is the, uh, the last system that I was going to talk about. Cosmos DB, which uh, was pronounced as DocDB, Cosmos DB, DocDB is a semi-structured database. Uh, how many people know what MongoDB is? Okay, it's, uh, it's like Mongo, but it's better. <laughs> um, and so how is it better? Well, it's, you know, it's ours and we love it, ours Microsoft. Um, but uh, it, um, this, I, I don't know if this is even legible. These are all the different consistency, update consistency protocols, uh, criteria that you can have. One thing that uh, Cosmos DB uh, offers is that on a per transaction basis, you can pick what, uh, what consistency level you want. All right, so you can say, I want this to be a strong transaction and it will uh, do what's necessarily necessary to make that uh, you know, strong and get all the replicas updated. If you're okay with just you know, doing an eventual consistency thing and you don't wanna wait or uh, you know, uh, want to be able to do an offline update or something like that, you can pick an eventual consistency uh, criteria for the, uh, for the thing. So now, you know, just think about the obligation to a programmer of implementing uh, these five different little click stops and, they, and billing, the business people bill differently because it costs more to implement a strong consistency transaction than a weak consistency transaction. Uh, so there's a, you know, a, a billing thing. Uh, but you know, your obligation as a programmer to implement five different consistency protocols, you know, consistency levels correctly. Uh, so what they did was specify uh, each of those consistency levels in TLA plus, okay? So you say what correctness is, and then uh, they took their implementation and um, uh, demonstrated that, you know, with the pro appropriate se setting, it implemented each one of those different, uh, uh, different things. And so, um, uh, it's a replicated system. They um, uh, had various attempts at getting it to, uh, to implement that correctly. So if you've got a, um, uh, an update against a database, the simplest way to do that is you just take and shift the state uh, to the other system. And if you uh, have a, uh, another update come in, you just figure out which one is the latest one and take that, right? So it turns out that um, uh, that, that did not work. Um, the issue is uh, if you have you know, one state and another state, you need to take and uh, put something between it. They couldn't, um, uh, they couldn't interleave them together. So for the, uh, for the second attempt, um, they sent not only the new state but in case the, uh, the other replica needed it in order to, uh, to weave the operations together, it sent the previous state uh, along with it. And so that fixed the, um, uh, the problem that had manifested, but uh, resulted in another more subtle bug, which is that um, uh, you still have this issue where you just have the, the states that are the result of an operation. And what you're really trying to do is weave together the operations. So the, uh, the final implementation, the one that's shipped and is correct against all those five different criteria are uh, they, you know, they ship the state. They also ship uh, to, the, to the replicas a chunk of the log, the, you know, wherever the update landed, it'll ship a chunk of the log as it sees it, all right, to the other replicas. And then those other replicas can take and they've got the actual operations and can weave them together and uh, that results in uh, satisfying all of the different criteria. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, I think I forgot to mention who did this. Dharma Shukla um, is a you know, development manager, now a vice president and a technical fellow and Karthik Rahman is a uh, development manager. And then uh, there was also work on his team to, uh, you know, to implement this. 
Okay, so um, those are the systems that I was going to tell that you know that I have to tell you about. Um, I was just going to share some general observations about uh, the exercise, uh, trying to get you know masses of people to um, uh, to implement you know to use TLA plus. The you know one thing that I you know thought and is kind of you know different about TLA plus from let's say Java or C plus plus or C sharp is that it's not a you know a curly braces type type language. The syntax is very different. Uh, you know, it's like LaTeX, and then he's got these kind of, you know, bulleted, uh, you know, ands and ors. Uh, people just, like, the syntax almost never came up, with the exception of the indentation issue and understanding that, uh, you know, indentation was significant, because people just didn't care. Once you told them, they're like, you know, uh, looked at you funny, said why, and then just snapped to it. Right, so that was not difficult. Getting started like all by yourself without somebody else to kind of get you over the speed bumps, uh, that proved to be, uh, you know, that has proved to be difficult. It's hard to start by yourself. But, you know, when we have a whole bunch of people sitting in a room uh, working on it, then um, that did work, right? It helped somehow and so um, so I've got starting in isolation is a uh, you know is difficult um, then uh, going back I mentioned there was kind of a question about you know whether or not people could do this and um, you know learn TLA in such a short period of time um, uh, I believe they could, and so that's why we ran this. Um, Leslie was a little more skeptical about whether or not people could learn all of uh, TLA plus in, you know, two days. And the fact is, we're both right, right? There's no way you can learn all of TLA plus and everything you can do with it in two days, right? But what we had is highly trained engineers that really knew the thing that they were specifying very, very well. Okay, so they understood what the problems were with it, and they understood that. All right, now you've got this new thing that they don't understand quite as well, uh, but you know have seen some things that they do, some get the shape of it, um, and you know for when they get stuck on something or have a question, there's sort of some people around that may also be brand new to it, uh, but you know are stuck on a different problem. Uh, you know maybe they understand the indentation, but don't understand like messaging or how to deal with uh, you know non-determinism or something like that. Um, uh, having them around helped them get going. So it was their understanding of whatever system they were trying to implement that sort of let them you know that carried them forward. Um, the you know the fundamental issue that we were looking at was do we form a team of people within MSR? to, uh, you know, go off and write specs for people in Azure and show them to them. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that's my boss was trying to convince me I should go hire a bunch of people and go off and do this. Um, uh, sort of what I, you know, wanted to do and what I believe that it's actually better for the engineers, you know, the developers, that are building those systems to learn TLA plus and learn TLC than to go with that other approach for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is it's for these systems, in order to learn them well enough to understand the subtleties and where the bugs are gonna come from, that's a super high bar. And it's difficult for somebody who doesn't understand that system well and how it's built in and interact with other things. It's very, very difficult for uh, for them to do that. And then, the, uh, and then the second reason is I think, I believe that, you know, using TLA um, and uh, TLC makes programmers better, right? It makes them think more clearly. And so, uh, so I think of TLC as an anti-runtime. 
what is a runtime? A runtime is like the Java runtime or .NET or you know, Linux or something like that. And what does a runtime do? The job of a runtime is you give it a program, okay, and it's supposed to run that program for as long as it can without creating an error, right? That's what they do, all right? What does TLC do? It takes the program that you give it, any program, and runs it for the shortest period of time, okay, with an error, all right? So it's an anti-runtime. It does exactly the opposite of what a, you know, a real system is supposed to, you know, a production system is supposed to do. Um, and so it's like working with a, you know, a chess tutor or something like that. Um, and that exercise of pushing against the, uh, the adversary makes people think about, you know, delayed messages or uh, double restart or all of these different issues. I mean, there's really, you could kind of look at the, uh, the category of bugs that people have found. It's like uh, long delayed messages and double restart. Um, if you sort of took those two, there's probably like 80% of the, uh, you know, the issues that people have found are by thinking clearly about what it takes to, uh, you know, to get that. And, the, and so the benefit of, you know, writing the TLA spec and checking it with TLC, it benefits the author of that spec, you know, not, uh, not some, somebody else. So, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks.